Hello, and welcome to Fellowship Church Rouge Park. We are so glad you're here. If you're a first-time guest, thank you for joining us. Good morning. Uh, each of us in life have taken different knocks. Uh, some of us are, are still facing the bruises of those knocks. Some of us have healed, but we have those scars. And we're kind of like a, a broken mirror here. Uh, all of us have some brokenness in our life. And some of it may have come from your parents. Some of it may have come from your, your, your school days, way back out on the playground. Uh, some of it may have come from uh, work situations even right now. And today, we're going to look at how can we get a deeper, satisfying life. The Lord wants to comfort us through verses like Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. So if you're here today, uh, the message is for you that God has uh, something new, a new life, precious life, something satisfying to meet us in our circumstances when we don't know what we're going to do. Whether you're a believer or not, uh, God wants to bring you full life and satisfy you. And all of us are, are made in the image of God, but this image has been smashed and broken. And this, this image of God in us gives us our worth. It tells us that we are have tremendous worth, because if we're given the same Im image of God, it means that we have the ability to reason, the ability to, to uh, think through things. We know the difference between right and wrong. However, the consequences of sin in this broken world have, have destroyed that image to some degree. It's not the same as it used to be. And so this is why we, why we don't always have that fullness of life. This is why we are looking for something more to satisfy us. And we can look for satisfaction and maybe I can get a better degree. Maybe I can uh, do better in my job and get a promotion. Maybe I can find somebody to marry me and that will satisfy me. But actually the Lord says, I have something even better for you. Uh, and, and Christ wants us to experience his new life. John 10.10, 10, in the book of John, it says, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. And he wants us to experience it. It's, it's actually a supernatural life that takes us above our circumstances. You know, our circumstances often aren't very good, are they? Uh, each of us has headaches, health problems, uh, hassles at work. Maybe there's somebody at work that... Every time you go to work, it's just like more trouble. This person's just nothing but trouble, right? And, and so we, we deal with these battles, and we battle on the 401. By the time you get to work, if you've traveled the 401 during rush hour, you're already exhausted when you arrive. At least I am. And so we, we face all these, these battles in life. And Christ is saying, I got something for you that is above your circumstances, and that will satisfy you whether you go through difficulties or not. Just this last fall, my wife had cancer. And Anita and I were looking at, are we going to see our grandchildren grow up? What does life hold for us? You go through all these struggles. And yet, when we came to the Lord, he gave us that abiding peace, that satisfaction that only he can give, even when the bottom falls out of your life. Now, we thank the Lord that in January she was declared clear uh, after surgery, so we're thankful for that. But you know, each of us has difficulties in life, and Christ is here to tell us that I got something for you that is better than anything that the world can offer you, better than anything. And so we're going to look at uh, John chapter 1, verse 1 to 14. And I'm going to read it. John chapter 1, verse 1 to 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did not receive, who, all who did receive, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, John uses a term here called the word. And he was writing to both believers and unbelievers. And to those who are Greek, the word, this, this word logos, meaning the word, it meant to them that this is the spoken idea of the mind that controls and uh, keeps the universe in order. That was the Greek thought. To Jews, it meant it's the word of God that is spoken and his word produces immediate action. So when we read in Genesis 1 that says, and God said, let there be light, and there was light instantly. Can you imagine? God spoke a word, and there was light. So uh, this passage is telling us that the word was in the beginning, and then in verse 14, it explains that this word became flesh. So the spoken word of God existed in the beginning, was already there, and then some point in history, he came and became flesh which is Jesus Christ. John is saying that Jesus Christ existed before the world was created. Let me ask you a question. Uh, who is Jesus to you? It's probably the most important question you will answer in, in all your life. Who is Jesus to you? John says this is, this is who Jesus is. In verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. It's, it's almost as if he would say, when the beginning began, the Word was already there. When the beginning began, the Word was already there. He also says, and the Word was with God. So there's two identities here. The Word was with God. There's Christ and the Father. There's the Son and the Father. It also says that the Word was God. Christ is God. Now, I, just to illustrate this, I've asked Sean to come up. Come on up, Sean. And I'm going to ask uh, Sean a question. So, Sean, what are you? Human being. Okay, Sean's a human being. All right, so he's part of the human race. Now, Sean, who are you? I'm Sean. You're Sean. Okay. See, he's Sean. So God is, God is uh, a being. He is God. However, he has three persons in his Godhead, not like us. We have one person. Sean is just one person, right? He's got, there's just one Sean here. But with God, he, even though he is the being of God, he has three persons. It's different than us. It's hard for us to grasp. But we can see that uh, John is claiming the Word was with God and was God. So he has three persons. The, the person of the Father, the person of the Son, who was not born uh, before creation. He's figuratively a son in that he's just like the Father, just like a, a father-like son. So it's a figurative speech that the Son is uh, 
close to the Father. He's just like him. And then the third person is the Holy Spirit. Okay, thanks, John. So we, we see here a trinity that God is a being. He's God. Jesus is God. The Father is God. The Holy Spirit is God. Three persons in one being. And he's the source of life. So when you think of it, if the word was God and he is the spoken word of God and he spoke the creation, that means that at creation, Jesus said, let there be light. And there was light. Christ said, let the waters separate from the land. And it happened. He said, let the air be filled with birds. And there were birds and the fish of the sea teeming millions of fish. And then he said he created the animals, and then he made man. He was there right at the beginning. That's who Christ is. And so let me ask you, is this Christ big enough for your problems? If he can speak the stars into place, the galaxies. Have you ever looked at pictures of the stars? I love, I love those. I collect sometimes pictures of the stars. It just sets me in awe of who God is. And actually, we should be in awe of who Christ is because he is God. And he put the stars in place. So is he big enough for your problems? We, we experience new life by worshiping this Christ. Because when we see all that he made, it just causes us to say, wow. And not only that, but he made me and he made you. He made us in all our complexity. And so as we worship him, as we, as we bow down before him, he will give us that that life that supersedes our circumstances. You know, when we get our eyes off of ourselves and off of our problems, and we put them on Christ, and we see him as, and his greatness, then my problems don't seem so big, because he can put the stars in place, and he can hold them in place, and he can hold me together. And so then that gives me a sense of purpose and, and new life. Not only that, but he is our source of life, and we can, we can find him to be all that we need because he gives us light. Look at verse 4. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. There's a, a fascinating uh, uh, corollary in nature with monarch butterflies. And monarch butterflies are amazing creatures. When we go up north uh, to the lake in the summertime, sometimes we see these monarchs come through. They, there's a whole bunch of them come through, and they land on this milkweed, and they love to eat milkweed leaves, so they all congregate there. And they're making their migratory trip all the way to a specific mountain in Mexico, about 300 miles north of Mexico City. It's a particular mountain. It's the only mountain. They all go there. They travel 2,000 miles down there. And researchers were trying to figure out how these monarchs can figure out their way to this specific place and not get lost. And so they took some monarchs and they painted black paint over their antennas. And then this other group of monarchs, they painted clear paint over their antennas. So they lost their sense of smell, but the ones that had black paint on their antennas got lost and they were confused. The ones that had clear paint on their antennas made it. And these monarchs are intricately made, and they have, a, they have a clock system in their antennas, and they have a GPS system in their antennas that work together. It's incredible. 
and their GPS uses the clock to tell them where the sun is. So they track the sun, and as the sun moves across the horizon during the day, this clock is measuring constantly and con transmitting information to their GPS to know how to make it, and they make it down all the way to this mountain. And they come by the millions to this particular place in Mexico. And so uh, sometimes people are like this. There's some people who have their antennas painted with black paint, and they can't see the light. And there's others who can see the light, and they recognize the light. And so it would be my prayer, if you can't see the light, to ask God to clean your spiritual antennas, to clean them off so that you can see the light. And if you can see the light, keep your focus on it. We experience new life by believing in Jesus Christ. It says in verse 9, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. See, they couldn't recognize him. They were like the, the butterfly with black paint on their antennas. They couldn't see. He came into his own, and his own people did not receive him. But some, but all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men, but of God. And so by believing in Jesus Christ, we receive right, the right to become his children. We have an adopted granddaughter. She's Chinese. Our daughter and son-in-law are not Chinese at all. So when you see a picture of them, there's uh, five in the family. There's four whites and one Chinese girl. They adopted her. And they told her right from the beginning. They even made a book about her adoption and where she came from and explained it all. And Anita made a, a picture book uh, to, to uh, talk about her, her life. And she was adopted into their family. And Christ is saying, if you will believe in me, the true light of the world, who came down from heaven into this world to, to reveal God to you, and you believe in me, you will become my adopted child of God. It's, it's, a, it's a supernatural work of God, and then he will give you supernatural life. And if you are a believer, for believers, we need to keep our eyes on the light, on the, the light of Jesus Christ, because he will be our GPS. He will be your GPS. Have you ever gone to the wrong place because of your GPS? Right? Ah, we've, we've gone to the wrong place many times. The GPS that you use sometimes is inaccurate, right? Have you tried Google Maps? Occasionally they're wrong, right? Well, Jesus' GPS is never wrong, and he will never lead you astray. And if you keep your eyes on him, you will get to your destination every time in perfection because he's perfect. And so as we, as we reflect on this, Jesus says, you also are the light of the world. As we keep our eyes on the light, Jesus Christ, he says, we will reflect this light, and we will become the light of the world. And so as we reflect his light, we are, we are shining it to our coworkers at work. We are shining it to our students at school. We are shining it uh, to our neighbors that we meet. And they're watching you closely. They're watching you closely. They're watching everything you do. In fact, it's very unnerving. It's very unnerving when you have a neighbor across the street um, talking about things that you did to other neighbors. Because they're watching. They're talking about you. And yeah, we are told not to gossip in the Christian life, and we're not supposed to, but your neighbors will. And so will your student friends. And so will everybody at work talk about you. And they'll, try, they'll figure you out. 
And if you make a mistake, they'll hold you more accountable than they hold themselves accountable because you're supposed to be almost perfect, right? They'll hold you to that account. And so we're lights, and they, they see everything that we do. One of the things that we discovered uh, when we were in China teaching English to university students is that they watched everything we did too. They would come up to Anita and say, you treat us as your children, not your students. You even know my name. Not many teachers can do that. And so they're watching all kinds of things about us. And so we can be a light to them. How are we when we're upset at work? How are we when we're, we, we feel like losing our temper? How do we treat our other coworkers? They're watching how we treat this coworker, right? They're watching how we treat our, our doorm mates. And so you can be the light of, light of Christ in those situations. And he will use you as long as you stay connected to the GPS, right? So we not only experience new life by worshiping Jesus and by believing in him, but we experience new life in keeping a close relationship with him. I find that the Lord gives me ideas and thoughts and speaks to me in my mind and through the word of God when it's most quiet. Do you? Don't you find that? The Lord doesn't seem to like to try to compete with the noise. He doesn't like to try to shout over the din of confusion that we are in most of the time, right? That there's TV, there's traffic, there's horns, there's kids yelling, there's... I, I know you moms, you young moms have a challenge, especially. That's not easy. But try to find quiet time. I find that oftentimes it's very early in the morning, even when I just wake up. The Lord is there. And when it's quiet, he tends to talk to us. There's a guy in, uh, he has a factory in China. He's, a, he's an American. He said that Costco came to him and they wanted him to build a table. And so he took it to the Lord. He's a Christian. He took it to the Lord and he said, Lord, I need you to help me with a design for this table to make in my factory to sell to Costco. And so he said the Lord gave him a, a good idea. And he drew out this design. And then he said, a little while later, he said he got a, a better idea for this design. He was taking time with the Lord. And the Lord gave him a better idea uh, for this table. And uh, then this happened again. Happened again. And he was talking to the Lord. And he got an even better idea for this table. And he designed that. He worked on the design. Well, this happened about seven times. Each design was better than the previous design. And he was scratching his head after a while, and he said, Lord, you, you've been giving me these better designs. Why, did you, why didn't you just give me the best design in the first place? It would have been much simpler if you just told me the, like, I got this great design now. It's the seventh design. It's fabulous. Why didn't you tell me that in the first place? And he just sensed the Lord was saying, I just like spending time with you. And, and God is just waiting to spend time with us if we are willing to find the quiet to be with him. He's just looking for that opportunity. Revelation 3.20, you might know it. It says, here I am. This is Jesus talking. This is his very words. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. When, when you get together with friends, what do you usually do? Usually get some food out, right? Friends come to the door. The first thing you say, would you like coffee or tea? It's the first thing, right? And here, put your coat over here. We had some friends up, up at our place yesterday. It was great to have you. Some of them are here. We get the tea and the coffee out. We get juice out. We get water. Water's the last thing. And you just put it there. And then you get some food. 
and you fellowship together. It's always food, right? What does Jesus say? I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. I'm just going to hang out with you. We're going to have some snacks together. That's what he's asking. He's knocking at our door, the door of our heart, and he's saying, if you'll just be calm, you'll hear the knock at the door. And I'll come in and I'll hang out with you. And then we'll have Jesus, the very Son of God, the God who created and put the stars in place, hanging out with us. Isn't that incredible? And so we need to take that time, just find that time to be with him. And we will experience his life. He's the source of life. We'll experience that new life as we spend time with Jesus. Oh, what we might miss without a close relationship with Christ. So we experience new life by responding to the light of Jesus Christ. By worshiping him, by believing in him and becoming his child, and by having a close relationship with him. As the monarch butterflies keep a close watch on the sun for their GPS, so we need to keep a close eye on the Son of God as the guiding light in our lives. And then he'll satisfy all that we need. Uh, aside from our circumstances, he'll satisfy us.